Well, the last couple of weeks, um, we've been having a little bit of a cooking class. Although I have to say, you know, normally when you have a cooking class or a cooking show, you actually cook. Um, if you notice, we haven't really been doing any cooking. And that's because the cooking has already been done for us. Um, the food has already been prepared. And so we've, we've been spending our time setting the table um, so that we can belly up to the Bible, that we can belly up to God's word and eat. And so um, two weeks ago, um, we talked about the table. And we need, we need a table to, well, we don't have to have a table, but it makes eating easier, right, if we have a table to sit down at. Um, I speak from a lot of uh, experience there because I have eaten, not eaten at a table many times, and it just doesn't work as well. Um, but this table has four legs, and each one of these four legs um, is important um, to the table and to the, the foundation on which we eat. And the first, the first leg represents the fact that Scripture um, is God's word. It was, it was God's idea. Um, it's authored by God. God is, is the author, the primary author of Scripture. He inspired Scripture to be written. Um, the second leg, um, it represents the fact that Scripture, the Bible, is made up of, of many different books, and it was actually written by many different authors. So Scripture is a divine book. It was written by God. It was God's idea. It was inspired by God but it was also written by individual people um, in unique situations and circumstances you know, over a span of over a thousand years. There are many, many authors of, of scripture. You know, our Bible is, is a collection of books. It's, it's a single book, but yet it's also a collection of books. And so um, scripture is a divine book, but it's also a human book. It's a divine book, and it, in, in, in it being a human book, it was, it was written to specific people in specific places in specific circumstances. And so <clears throat> each time we open scripture and we read, let's say, one of Paul's letters, Paul's, letter, Paul's letters were originally written to specific churches in specific places with specific problems. So it, it was written to specific people. And those people that it was originally written to, guess what? None of them are alive today. They're all dead. Right? Yeah. Um, but it wasn't just written to those people. It was also written to us. And so um, Scripture was written to us. And it wasn't just written to us, but it was written to all of God's People. And so sometimes, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of sitting down and opening up Scripture and feeling like God was just speaking directly to you and to your circumstance. Has anyone ever had that happen? My hand's up. Yeah. It was written to us, but we also, in knowing that it was written to us, we also recognize the fact that it was written to all of God's people. It's God's letter to the world, God's message to the world. And so we can feel God and we can know God speaking directly to us, but we're also humbled and reminded every time we open scripture, knowing that this isn't just God's word to us, but this is God's word for the world. So those are the four legs that support the tabletop. And the tabletop um, is important um, because the tabletop represents God's story, the big picture, the narrative. Um, this book is made up of many different books, and yet it tells one big story, one big narrative. And all of the different books in here are part of and feed into that story. And so whenever we sit down to read scripture, we're reminded that we place our plate on this table um, that, is, that represents God's 
big story, God's communication from the beginning of the world, God's story of communicating with men and women throughout history. And it it begins in a garden. It begins in in the garden with with Adam and Eve. Um, there's, There's a problem. They sin. That's a problem. Sin's in the world. And then the whole rest of the scripture talks about the solution to that problem. And it climaxes, it reaches its high point in the, in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, so when we, when we go to eat our Bibles, when we go to belly up to the Bible, we remember the legs that hold up the table, and we remember the tabletop and this big story of God. But talked about last week, it's a lot easier to eat if we have a plate. We can eat without it, but it's a lot easier to eat if we have a plate. And so this plate represents context. And that's, that's kind of a big word. Um, it sounds kind of academic, but it's really, it's really simple. Um, you know, everything has a context. Right now, we're sitting in this space, right? You can see the wood beams around us. You have a chair that you're sitting on. This is our physical context right now. You know, my feet are on this floor. Your feet are on this floor, unless you have your feet up and stuff, and that's, that's good. That's fine. Um, but, you know, we have this. We're in this context. And each passage that we read in Scripture has a context. It has a neighborhood that it's in, right? And so there's this, this what we call literary context where you're looking at what's before and after the passage that we're reading that provides its literary context. And then there's also what we call a cultural historical context. And that just helps us to remember that each passage in Scripture, each book in here, um, was written by an actual person in a specific time and place. And they, they lived in a, in a specific culture. And their culture shaped them and influenced them. And, and yet, and so that's important because, you know, so often when we read scripture, um, we're tempted to do this. We're tempted to hold this mirror um, up in front of us. And you know what? It keeps us from really being able to eat because we're just so busy looking at ourselves in the mirror, we forget that the passage we're reading has a, has a context. Um, you know, that it, was, that it was written to some other people first, and we need to consider that context. So, today, we're going to get to some other things that are a part of the table that make eating easier. Um, we have a, have a cup. Have a knife, fork, and a spoon. And these utensils remind us that Scripture, um, you know, it's it's these different books, and each there are many different types of literature within Scripture. For instance, there there's poems, there's poetry within Scripture. Um, there are law books within scripture. I don't know if you've ever been down to the library recently, but they've had all these free books that they're giving away or they're trying to sell, and they're these law books from Illinois, you know, and they're written in a certain way, (laughs) you know. There are law books in scripture. There are history books in scripture. Um, There are letters in scripture. There are books of prophecy in scripture. And some of those, you know, books and prophecy, a lot of them are written in poetic form. And, you know, this is just a little aside, you know, lots of times when we think of prophecy, we think about, oh, that's about like foretelling what's going to happen in the future. Can I tell you something? Prophecy is made up of two different types of writing. It's made up of foretelling, which is predicting what's going to happen in the future. And that's that's part of prophecy, but it's a very small part of prophecy. Do you know what the larger part of prophecy is? It's foretelling. It's God 
proclaiming his message, often his message of repentance. You know, turn your hearts towards me. Um, but there, there are all these different kinds of, of, of types of literature within Scripture. So if we open up, a lot of you are, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Psalm 23. And I'm just going to read it a little bit here. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Now when we read that, I bet every single person in here recognizes the fact that we don't actually go lay down beside a stream in green pastures. God's not standing there, you know, with his staff as a shepherd hurting us because, you know what, this, this passage compares us to sheep but do we all have four legs? No. I mean, that's common sense. We understand when we read this that, you know, it's a, it's a metaphor for something else. It, it's poetry. Um, but, so it's important for us to remember what kind of, what kind of literature we're reading when we read um, Scripture that helps us um, to be able to eat it. All right. So, got the table, got the, the tablecloth, got the plate and the silverware. And, but, you know, there's something else that I usually like when I eat, and that's a chair. And it's just nice when we eat scripture when, or when we eat a meal to be able to sit down. It makes the eating that much easier, and we can kind of pause, and it ho- helps us to slow down and eat. And this, this is not the right height for this table. <laughs> it's not good. I'm, I'm glad I don't have to eat like this every day. Um, but this, this chair represents the Holy Spirit. And it represents the fact that when we sit down to eat, uh, we sit in the presence of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is there if we invite him. He might be there anyway, but he likes us to invite him. And then... There's something else here that that helps when we sit down to read scripture, and that is, you know, sometimes it's nice just to have a little ambiance, right? And and this this candle represents space. It represents the idea of creating space. I've never lit this candle. Sometimes it takes a little time to create space, little intentionality. Um, but this candle represents space because I can sit down, and you know what? If I'm honest, my mind's on what do I need to do after this? How much time do I have to sit here? I have got to get that done. Oh my goodness, they're going to be wondering what happened. And where, you know, where that thing is, and I've got to get stuff done, and I, I can't sit here. This candle represents space. We need to create space. And I don't know about you, but at different points in my life, creating space has li- looked different. When I was a college student, and I had a roommate, you know, and you just can't get away from people, you know what I did to create space? to hear from God, I went to the library. And I'd sit down at one of the study corrals, and I'd have my Bible, and I'd get it out and put it in front of me. And there might have been other, thing, other books I needed to read and other things I needed to study, but I'd get out my Bible, and that is where I would sit, and that was how I created space, by going to the library. Because if I went back to the dorm room, you know, there were all kinds of people around, you know, and you just couldn't get away from people. So I'd go to the library. You know, um, today, you know, it's once the kids are out the door and gone and they're at school and Stephen is at work, then it's space. 
and I just, you know, have to hope that the dog doesn't lick me to death. You know, <laughs> creating space. Um, so how can we, how can we create space as we sit? And, and back to the chair. So we sit in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if we're going to eat scripture, we're going to belly up to the Bible, we are absolutely dependent. And we're going to really eat and be sustained. We're absolutely dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Because reading scripture, you know, we can sit down and we can read scripture, but if the Holy Spirit is not there guiding us, you know, we just don't see it. We may just not understand. We might miss something. Because scripture, because re- belling up to the Bible and reading scripture is more than just our Bible and us. It's about spending time with God. It's about being in God's presence. You know, when we sit down and we spend time with Scripture, it's about the Holy Spirit working in our lives and transforming us, creating space for him to transform us. When we give up those other things that we feel like we need to get done at the moment and create space and sit down, we open it up. We open we open up the door for the Holy Spirit to be able to work in our lives through Scripture and to speak to us through Scripture and to simply know that he is there with us through Scripture. So how do we do that? We kind of talked about it. Um, But the fact is it looks different for different people. You know, some people, they might create space by going for a walk, going for a run, maybe, you know, having your cell phone and listening to scripture. Go to, um, there's a Bible app you can get on your phone for free and you can listen to scripture, have it read to you, you know, as you're driving or as you're walking or as you're running. But the important thing is that we, we sit down and we eat. And you might think, well, what if I get it wrong? Well, here's the good news. We all have napkins. God gives us his grace, and it's a napkin. And so it's not so much, you know, whether or not we get it right, but that we just sit down and eat and trust that the Holy Spirit will, will speak to us. And, you know, sometimes, now, quite you might have a question, and I think this is something that I thought a lot about because there have been lots of times when I've sat down to read Scripture and I have not felt the Holy Spirit. I've not received a particular message from God. For all practical purposes, it, it just feels like it's kind of me and Scripture. But God asks us to sit down. And over time, as we sit there, we become more and more familiar with the ways in which God speaks to us. And we become more and more familiar with his voice. And God doesn't necessarily speak to us every single time we open this book. But you know what? If we, if we don't sit down and we don't belly up to the Bible, it's a lot harder for us to hear him. It's not impossible, but it's a lot harder for us to hear him. And so God just... God invites us to just simply sit down and belly up to the Bible. And all of this is helpful, but the important thing is that we sit down and that we belly up and that we begin to eat. And so I have a bit of a challenge for you this week. I would like you to think about, and I'd like you to one time this week, at least one time, I'd like you to sit down and belly up to the Bible. Think about how you can create space and then just do it. You know, and you may not want to think about it too much. You may want to just do it because sometimes we can overthink things. So just pull out the Bible and belly up to it. And if you don't have a Bible, we've got some in the foyer. You can take one with you. And then what I did is I made this little brochure because sometimes if I sit down to read the Bible, I'm like, okay, what do I do? How do I do this? I don't know. Um, So here are some different ideas. Um, Here's just read. Read. 
pick up the Bible, select a book within the Bible, such as the Gospel of Mark, and just start reading. Read until you get bored, fall asleep, or get called away. Don't worry about how much you read or how little. Just do it every day. But I'm asking you to do it once this week. Just try once this week. Read it until it jumps off the plate. Pick up the Bible, select a book within the Bible, such as the Gospel of Mark, and read until something jumps off the page at you and captures your attention. Then spend some time thinking and talking to God about whatever it is that makes you take notice. It might even be something really small and seemingly insignificant. You know, sometimes I'll be reading scripture and it's like a particular phrase or something just seems to jump off the page. And it's good to just sit with that for a while and maybe even write it down. But just sit with it and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you through whatever it was that jumped off the page at you. Um, Here's another idea. You could walk into it. Walk into the Bible and imagine that you are there. For example, put yourself in the place of one of the disciples who was on the boat with Jesus when the storm comes up in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. There's There's an example You know, you could take this this week and just sit down with that passage and then ask yourself, what do I hear, smell, taste, and see as I read this passage? What do you feel? Take some time to slowly digest the passage, imagining that you are there on the boat with Jesus. So actually put yourself into the passage. Here's another idea. Do the three by five. Um, Here's the thing. If you read three chapters from the Bible, five days a week. So just like Monday through Friday or whatever days work for you, you can read through the entire Bible in one year. It's called three by five. You know those three by five index cards? Three by five. Three passages, or three chapters, five days a week. And you can read through the entire Bible in a year. Here's another idea. Finish the story. Pick a smaller book like Esther or Ruth. Or Philemon, you know, it's like barely a page long, if that. And, and read it. Read it through in one sitting. Just read it. We don't often think about just reading a book of the Bible all the way through, but just, just read it all the way through. Start with a small one, though. Become a scribe. Find a passage that interests you. You know, maybe it was earlier you, you know, read that passage and something jumped out at you. Well, maybe the next day you might want to go to that passage, that part that jumped out at you, and just take some time, and just be a scribe. Actually copy down the words of Scripture and write it, write it out. Now, I wouldn't get too ambitious here. You know, keep it simple, you know, um, but, but write it out. Take your time focusing on each word, phrase, and sentence. I don't know how many times when I have actually written Scripture out by hand of a little journal, a little blank book that I write in, but you don't have to have that. You just have a piece of paper. How many times I've actually written scripture out by hand that God has spoken to me? Because there's something about writing scripture out. You know, and then take some time. If God speaks to you, write out a prayer to him. Or if you can't quite concentrate when you're sitting down, sometimes I find it helpful just to take my journal, take take a piece of paper, whatever, and just write out a prayer to him of everything that's on my mind and that's weighing me down at that moment and then read. Unleash the artist. Spend some time reading a passage of scripture and then sketching it out with pencil, pen, pastels, or even paint. You could even keep your own personal journal, which is nothing more than a collection of simple stick figure sketches. So there's another idea. You know, sketch it out. Sketch, you know, sketch scripture out. Whatever that looks like for you. Find a daily devotional guide and read it and the corresponding scripture each day. Here's a, here's a simple one. You know, this week, starting on Ash Wednesday, we're going to be using this book called Altered. And you, you can get that through the wake-up call. Um, or let me know if you, if, you, if you need a written copy of it. Um, but that, that's an example where you can create space, have that daily devotional guide. Or just find your own st- style. There are lots and lots of different ways um, to dig in and to eat scripture. Um, but I just want to pass, pass these out, something that you can take with you um, 
and just get creative. And you know, sometimes if something has worked for you in the past, but it's not working right now, sometimes it helps just to change it up. I know I have a friend, she's like always changing it uh, because she just gets bored doing the same thing over and over. I'm one of those people, I can do the same thing forever. Um, but, but some of us need to change things up. So find some time this week to create space, to sit down in the Holy Spirit, and to belly up to the Bible.